Welcome to the Wall Podcast, where the goal is to motivate, inspire, and share success principles. I'm your host, George Almasri. Thanks for tuning in. I interviewed Elizabeth Kelly, who's a longtime investor. She bought her first investment property in 2005. And then in 2008, she took the Rich Dad, Poor Dad real estate courses and realized she now owned some properties that were no longer cash flowing. She had to shift her strategy, started doing some RTOs, and slowly sold off some of her portfolio. And since that point, she has successfully flipped, wholesale, duplexed, renovated, and refinanced dozens of properties. She started guest speaking for Rich Dad Canada in 2010 and became one of the company trainers in 2012. So on this episode, we talked about what Elizabeth did to turn her negative cash flow properties around in 2008, common challenges for investors uh, that she's seeing today as a coach, why many investors hoard properties and how that can hurt them how she has repositioned her portfolio and also the importance of health and the freedom you get from running your own business. I know you guys are going to enjoy this. She offers a consultation at the end of the episode, so feel free to reach out to her. And I will kind of do the same as a thank you to all you guys for supporting the show. If you are running into any challenges, which I know a lot of people are right now, uh, another opinion might be helpful. So feel free to reach out to me. You can book a call on my website as well. I'm happy to give you my opinion. I know you are likely going to get many opinions, but uh, another set of eyes on your on your deal might be helpful. So feel free to reach out. There you go. Enjoy the episode. All right. I'm here with Elizabeth Kelly for the second time. Thank you for coming by. I know the first time it was a virtual call, so it's nice to be face-to-face. I always say that. Um, tell me a little bit about uh, what you've been up to lately, some of the changes you've experienced in your life. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me back. Obviously, it means I was well enough behaved on the first episode (laughs) that you'd let me back on. I appreciate that. Um, So I I guess I'm like a lot of other investors out there where, you know, where where some of us are are sitting patiently waiting to see kind of what's going to happen. I came through 2008 and it was a a tough market then, too. So um, we're actually in the point we started um, restructuring and moving our portfolio around, I guess, about a year and a half ago now, um, I have uh, I have a, a different vision for what I want my future to look like. Um, so we're letting some of our properties go. We're repositioning others, and uh, yeah, we're basically taking advantage of some of the opportunities to move into some different areas and look at some different investment strategies. Mm-hmm. Uh, just in case somebody like it's the first time they they're listening to you speak, can you tell us a bit about your background? Because I know you have. Uh, Well, first of all, you're a coach, but you've also done some coaching for Rich Dad Canada, right? Yes. So I started investing with my husband in 2005. In 2008, we were introduced to Rich Dad and we invested a significant amount of money in our education. And um, then we started buying in buying apartment buildings in 2009, and we started doing uh, rent to owns as well. And we grew up really big, really quickly. And um, then I had the opportunity to go back, and it started. I just shared my experiences with other Rich Dad students, and then from there they asked me to become a trainer. So I spent eight years. I taught the uh, lease options course, I taught sales and negotiations, and then I wrote and taught a course called Momentum, which is all the fundamentals that people need to know to become investors it's how do you build a power team you know should you incorporate you know what do you look for when you're analyzing a market it was all those fundamental skills that can be applied anywhere Mm -hmm. and um, I did that until 2020 and I realized how many people were struggling like I would meet people in my course in 2015 and I'd see them again at an alumni event in 2017 and they hadn't bought anything yet. Mm-hmm. And when I talked to them about, you know, the challenges they were having, it's, you know, I'm overwhelmed with information. I I, I don't know what to do. I, I don't know, you know, I, I've, you know, continued to watch podcasts and everything and, and I'm not confident in my decisions I'm making or, you know, for a good chunk of people, it's I'm, I'm alone in this investment journey and I have nobody to bounce ideas off of and I have no sounding board. Yeah. And I really felt kind of compelled at that point to start doing more coaching. I was doing kind of a little bit on the side when people approached me now and then, but I really wanted to help people save for their retirement and, and, you know, achieve their goals because I'm very grateful to the people who helped me on my journey. And I know if it wasn't for my husband and his absolutely crazy drive, I probably would not, well, I definitely wouldn't have done as much as I have. 
you, we all need that, you know, person, that cheerleader, someone in our corner, helping us, supporting us, guiding us. And, um, I'm really honored that, um, I've been able to be that for a lot of people. Yeah. And that makes me think as you're talking that, you know, for the people listening that might just have one rental property or two or something like that, Mm -hmm. they might not feel so good at times because Mm -hmm. they might be looking at other people that have a lot more, but congratulations on making it there because not a lot of people invest like like you said yeah over analyze or they're afraid or they let things get in the way so mm-hmm. um yeah don't don't beat yourself up and actually like really celebrate the fact that you have even just one or two rental properties it's a big accomplishment absolutely and and i think a lot of it comes down to not the quantity of properties you have because you and i were talking a few minutes mm-hmm. ago that investors tend to become property hoarders and they believe that their success as an investor is tied to the number of deals that they've done. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people are finding right now, they might have, you know, five, 10, 15 properties, but if they're negatively cash flowing, they're better off with none. For sure. So this is a a really painful time. And especially for people who are starting out, you know, I I talked to a a couple last week and they have two condos that are negatively cash flowing right now. And they're having a really hard time with the idea of letting them go because they they're like but this, these are our only investments mm-hmm. you know this, we this so is what we've done we, get here. we worked so hard we to, get to get here the mortgage we had to jump through all these hoops to get these properties yeah. and now you're saying we should let them go yeah and I, i'm like but it's 2500 dollars a month like that's another job you need to get and if you have you know if you're a really high income earner like a doctor and you have an extra twenty five hundred dollars a month you can throw at something you know against the future appreciation in you know 20 years that's fine but for most of us as investors we're we need to at least break even and ideally generate some cash flow mm-hmm. so this is a, a tough time where people are really I find people are really down and they're kind of criticizing themselves. You know, maybe I'm not a successful investor. You know, these, these markets are hard for everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think there is that, there is that fine kind of balance at this point because rates are so high. Mm -hmm. You want to take out equity, but at the same time, you have to make sure that you're still cash flow positive. And then you're also anticipating what if the rates go up even more? Am I still going to cash flow? Because like you said, you don't want to take out so much equity that you're now negative and bleeding on a bunch of properties. Yeah. I I think the thing to keep in mind is it's not necessarily taking out the equity that could be problematic. It's what do you do with it? Mm -hmm. So if you take out the equity and you use that for private lending and it generates some positive cash flow and income so that it more than covers and it puts you in a better position when you factor in, you know, the, the income that you're making with that chunk of equity, that's fine. But if you take out the equity and use it to go on a trip or to buy another negatively cash flowing asset, you're you're putting yourself in, in harm's way for yeah. sure. Well, on that topic, like private lending is an interesting thing right now because rates like A lenders are at 7%. Yes. Right. So yeah. where do you go if you're a private lender? You know, there's how high can you possibly go? And it's got to make sense for you. But also, like, who's going to be able to get a mortgage, you know, at 12 percent or 14 percent and hold on to that? Mm-hmm. Right. So it, it's it's an interesting time for private lending, right? It, it is. And there's some people who are very nervous about the market. So, you know, they're they're doing less private lending or, you know, they're they're um, tightening up their underwriting criteria. So maybe they're not lending to flippers right now. Um, but the, the opposite side of this is what's coming down the pipe. And um, I have a client who works at one of the banks and he's part of the collections team. And the mortgage default, or not the mortgage default, the, um, the payment rates on lines of credit and credit cards are decreasing. And that's something that historically Canadians, we've always been really good at paying our mortgages and paying our debts. But when we start to see those numbers creep up, you know what's going to happen next is mortgages aren't going to get paid. And, you know, with with all the costs that have cre- increased so dramatically, there's going to be, unfortunately, a percentage of the population that won't be able to keep their, their homes. Yeah. So that's going to increase the pool of renters, but it's also going to mean that there's people, motivated sellers with properties either listed with realtors or that are going to wholesalers. Yeah. Well, historically, Canada has been amazing from from what I've seen from the stats mm-hmm. when it comes to mortgage default. It's very low. Extremely low. Extremely low. So I, I'm wondering if that is that number is going to creep up? And if so, how high do you think 
have you seen any any data any projections on where that's that number is going to be so we're historically under well under one yeah. percent um, I think we could creep up to around four percent Wow so I think the play right now is access to capital is is important so that when the opportunities arise that we can take advantage of them that we have the ability to be able to and the funds to be able to jump on and say hey you know what I can see you're struggling you know the the bank's knocking at the door listen um, you know I I can offer you this amount for your house and I'll help you find a new place mm -hmm. you know like we, we never want to create situations where we're taking advantage of people who are in a tough place that that's not what we want to do but you know as someone who does offer rent to owns as well I I like to help people and there unfortunately will be people it's much better to be able to sell your house before you have you know um, some sort of collections whether bank uh, whether it's power of sale foreclosure it that's not something you want on your credit history it's really hard to get a mortgage after you have something like sure. that now that that four percent default rate that you mentioned is that just like a personal opinion or is that based on certain reports you've seen yeah it's just or? a personal opinion yeah. right yeah. okay um, so let's go back to that hoarding properties thing <laughs> <laughs> yeah because i think that's really interesting um do you think that so a lot of investors like you said they have kind of this emotional attachment mm -hmm. to a property um what what would be maybe a way that you would coach somebody who is in that situation where they have that property that isn't really doing them mm -hmm. the kind of justice that they expected when they first purchased it as an investment how would you coach somebody in that situation what kind of questions would you ask that's a great question. Um, so the first thing I, I normally do is I encourage them to step back and I remind them that the perspective, you know, when they became a real estate investor, they made the decision based on the numbers and that it's important to take that step back and to remember that the numbers are, are why we're here and that we need to continue to analyze them. And I find another habit a lot of investors have is they buy a property with, you know, projections like they fill out their, you know, their deal check or their spreadsheet or whatever it is. And they have these, you know, I think the, the income's going to be this and the expenses are going to be this. And until they file their taxes the next year, they haven't paid attention to see whether those numbers are actually accurate. And they just keep running properties with those same numbers. Mm -hmm. So we have to stay focused on the numbers and we have to try and remove the the emotion from it. Yeah. And sometimes people just need that kind of gentle nudge like, hey, the number of properties you own does not dictate whether you're a successful investor. Yeah. It's how much money you actually keep at the end by the time you covered all your expenses and you've paid all your taxes and everything else. That's the determining factor. Sure. Yeah. I, I think probably newer investors or people that don't invest mm -hmm. care more about the number of properties than mm -hmm. seasoned investors because like you said they they understand that it's really the cash flow and kind of the lifestyle that you create but yeah, yeah i do i do get asked sometimes like oh how many properties do you own or how many doors and it doesn't really matter <laughs> no honestly i don't pay attention to that um because it's not a metric that in in my world is something that's significant um i pay a lot more attention to like how much am i working how much time do i have to put in and that was what became one of the determining factors for me was it's time to reposition my portfolio because I suddenly realized that I was working and working and working and we got into real estate because we wanted to create financial and time freedom and we created financial freedom and gave ourselves jobs mm -hmm. and I'm like this is not the life that I wanted to live yeah so you know the worst thing you can do is to have that realization and then do nothing about it well someone maybe like yourself or maybe it's your husband they ha you said he has this drive yeah. Um, <laughs> is that something he can turn off? Like his you know, drive? Yeah. Like no. when you get to a certain point, you reach your goals, you get to financial freedom, but then what? Like, is your husband going to sit at home and do nothing? No. Or yeah. So, I guess the question is, when you get when you reach your goals, how do you redirect your drive if you don't want to have that job, like you said? Yeah. That's a great question. And and it's funny because I think sometimes I become responsible for redirecting him when I'm like, no, 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 that's enough. We, we own enough here. Time to move on. Um, but I, I think it's um, a lot of us have trouble sitting down and relaxing. It's almost like I find real estate investors, like we have this compulsion, we have this drive, we have this voice in our heads that says, I must do this. I must do more. I must find another. I must... Um, 
it, it's a very, I think it probably has something to do with sort of the entrepreneurial mindset. Like I have friends who, you know, they they work for the government. They're very happy with what they do. They don't seem to experience this drive that, that I see a lot of real estate investors having, you know, a lot of real estate investors, very fit, you know, very active, working out, you know, um, bettering themselves, personal development, you know, Tony Robbins, like mm-hmm. this is, this is very much a, a part of the lifestyle. Um, so I think leaning a little more into that kind of self-care aspect is important. And this is something that I've learned in the last year when I've had some health challenges is, phew, thank goodness I wasn't an employee because my experiences over this last year would have been really different if sure, I was. Sure. Yeah. So tell maybe if you can expand, not necessarily what your challenges were, <laughs> but um, like if you can tell us how, in what way not having a job, not having a career, like a, a salary yeah. was beneficial for you? Um, well, it meant, so I got sick in June and I had several trips to the emergency room. I was trying desperately to find a doctor um, and I, I couldn't find anyone. I, I couldn't find someone who could see me within a reasonable amount of time. Is this in Kirkland Lake? Or? No, this is in Toronto. I, got, I actually got sick in Ottawa uh, the, the first time. So I, I, I got to experience the emergency room in Ottawa. They're, they're pretty good. They're pretty good there. Mm-hmm. Um, but it just, it meant that if I woke up one morning and wasn't and couldn't do it, that that was okay. I didn't have to call anyone. I didn't have to get a doctor's note. I didn't have to explain myself. And when I was, as I was becoming more and more unwell, I actually had the opportunity to be able to look and see, you know, if I go down to the U.S., how much would it cost me to have to have surgery down there? If I go to Tijuana, Mexico, how much would it cost me to have health care there? And I'm not under the impression that if I didn't have my job, that would be a possibility. For a lot of people, it's just not. Mm -hmm. So not only did I not have to justify every minute of every day and could I take the time that I needed to rest, recover, heal, and come back, but it also meant that I had the funds to be able to say, if I can't get healthcare within the time that I want it in Canada, I still have options and opportunities. Yeah, for sure. This, uh, it kind of makes me think, I read a book a few years ago, it was called The Top Five Regrets of the Dying. Mm. Not to say that that was um, the, the, applicable in your case, but um, <laughs> <laughs> one, of the, one of the things that stood out to me that I, I remember clearly was how one of the things that kept coming up is people saying, I wish I had like traveled more mm-hmm. or just enjoyed my life more while I was healthy Mm -hmm. because they get to a point where they they just work, work, work. And then by the time they're ready to relax, they get sick or something happens and they're no longer able to travel, no no longer able to really spend time with their loved ones. So um, I guess we can get caught up in that, like you said, because we're so focused on let's grow the business, let's get more real estate, let's do this and that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's just an interesting thing to to, to remember like your health and um, really just enjoying your life is is the priority. And I think what you were saying was redirecting your energy from growing your business and and uh, being an entrepreneur to self-care. Yeah. So that's, that's a really good point. Yeah, I, I think, you know, it doesn't matter how much money you have if you don't have your health and you don't have your happiness. And the things that, you know, I thought would make me happy when I was younger, um, I figured out they really don't. It's the simpler things that actually make me happy. It's, you know, the ability to be able to go for a walk and, and, you know, to spend time with my family. And it's those small things that I would rather do than go shopping or go partying or all those other things that, you know, when, when I was in my teens and my twenties, that was what I thought would make me happy. What kind of adjustments have you made in your portfolio to adjust to your new way of thinking? Well, um, (laughs) we're definitely moving away from the tenant management portion of it. Um, it, it's been a, it's been a challenging, it's been a challenging few years with, with tenant management, especially during COVID. Um, I just find that I'm, I'm tired. It's, it's the emergency calls in the middle of the night. It's, you know, we've had several fires in the last little while. The fires are, they can be, you know, it's pretty much 48 hours of go, go, go straight. You know, you got your every hour you have to do the fire watch. Somebody has to walk through the building. Like, and I always try and protect my staff from having to do that kind of stuff because it's the stuff that burns them out the fastest and it burns us out. 
So for me, the strategies that I'm looking at in the future are more like land development. They're more, you know, conversion, say, from commercial to residential, like those kinds of strategies that don't have, you know, the critical deadlines. They don't they don't involve the firefighting Mm. the way that residential real estate does. Right. So. Where, why did you have fires? Was it just like tenants uh, doing something and it caused a fire or? Um, one of them was a fire that spread from a building next door. So then our building caught on fire. Um, one of them was um, an electrical, well, two of them were electrical issues. And then one of them was tenant uh, carelessness. Okay. Now the electrical fire, was that, was it just a really old building that had old electrical or like what was the situation there? Uh, I think so. Um, a lot of the, I mean, I guess you might see it around sort of the GTA, but in a lot of the kind of smaller communities, um, what happens is a lot of people try are trying, a lot of landlords try and do things uh, as inexpensively as they can. So they might not have, you know, the knowledge that they need to do some of the, the electrical. I mean, it, electrical is not something that I would ever recommend that an investor try and do themselves unless they're a licensed electrician. Mm-hmm. Like you, you want to hang wallpaper, you know, you want to put up tile, like go nuts, fill your boots. But Electrical is not something that yeah. that we should be doing ourselves because it does end up, and it might not end up like you know in a fire in the first ten years or the first twenty years, but you know as things age and you know move around and settle, it, it's uh, yeah, it, it's definitely a risk that I don't recommend. Do you happen to know just specifically what caused what? what- electrical component failed was it like just the wiring um an issue with the wiring or was it like a a plug that was installed incorrectly do you happen to know i don't off the top of my head i know there was arcing and i know it was in the wall but i'm not sure if there was like a junction box there or if there was an outlet or exactly what happened but i know it started behind one of them started behind the stove oh okay in the in one of the kitchens yeah 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 well i guess i guess you do have to be careful and maybe it depends on the building, but you might want to maybe just get it inspected. But generally, like personally, when I have a unit turnover, then mm-hmm. I'll get somebody in there, look at all the wiring and tell me if they feel like it should be replaced. Yeah. We had one uh, We had one place recently where I was hoping not to rewire it because obviously the added cost, but the electricians went in and they're like, you really need to get this all out and yeah. redo it. It's pretty bad. So I uh, definitely don't want the place burning down because of that. Yeah. And and I think a lot of that comes down as well to, you know, sort of your philosophy as an investor. So there's a certain type of investor who buys new and there's a certain type of investor who buys older. And one of the things that I didn't realize, you know, in 2008, 2009, when we were running numbers to buy all these big apartment buildings, the older buildings, if you don't put the money in at the beginning into the plumbing, into the wiring, you're going to put the money, the same amount of, amount of money in. It's just over time. Mm -hmm. You know, we had a a building um, up north and every time we touched the plumbing, like you'd go in because, okay, there was a there was a small crack in in one of the pipes under the sink and you go in and you touch it and the whole thing would disintegrate all the way back somewhere into the walls. Wow. And it's just the plumbing had reached the end of its life. The pipes had reached the end of their lifespan. Yeah. So if you're buying one of those older buildings, budget more at the beginning, save yourself time, money, and heartache and potential insurance claims and upgrade the plumbing and upgrade the electrical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I kind of had that that sort of experience. I bought a, a fiveplex a few years ago mm-hmm. and this place was horrible. Like, Oof. <laughs> really, really bad, um, the plumbing, everything. And I had to just, the tenants didn't want to leave, so I had to constantly repair things And mm-hmm. as, as the issues came up. But just over the last year, like everything got overhauled and Mm -hmm. that place, like it's not cheap to renovate these things. So I bought it for four thirty five. I ended up spending about three fifty on on everything, like just ripping everything out and redoing it all all the units, everything. So it almost cost as much to renovate as it did to buy the building. Yeah. And where was the building? It's in Welland. Okay. Yeah. So do you think that you would see that back now if you had an appraisal done on the building or something close to it? Or did you invest more than it's worth at this Uh, point? No, it was appraised at 930. 
so. but this was a couple months ago so maybe it's down a little bit but it's still mm-hmm. i still got the money out for the most part so um but at least now i know i can relax and th- know that i don't have any more issues hopefully for a while yeah. with this building so well that's it because like how many emergency calls are you going to get and how much you know how many floods are you going to have where you have to go in and clean everything up and replace you know drywall and yeah. paint and all that other stuff like it, it's it's the whole philosophy that i look at too so i <laughs> sometimes i ask my clients I'm like how do you like to take your band-aids off and they're like what i'm like how do you like to take your band-aids off do you want them off fast you just rip them right off mm. or do you want to take them off slowly like one millimeter at a time yeah because sometimes that's kind of the decision you need to make and that was you know when we invested in a portfolio in new brunswick you know things we we looked at it we started buying in 2010 out there and then you know by 2014 2015 we're looking at it we're like we're not seeing any appreciation here like stuff isn't going up you know there, there's units that need work but we can't if we put the money in we won't get it back out again mm-hmm. and and we kind of talked about like how do we want to rip this band-aid off do we want to you know come up with a couple of thousand dollars a month to support the portfolio or do we want to you know list the properties for sale and take you know tens of thousands of dollars worth of losses yeah, yeah. and we decided to you know wait it out and it took 10 years the market came back or the investors drove up the market i'm not 100 mm-hmm. percent sure of the fundamentals there but um yeah, you just kind of sometimes it's better to rip the Band-Aid off and take the loss than it is in your case. It's better to invest in upgrading the building than just keep dealing with these ongoing issues. And then your tenants get frustrated and you're frustrated and yeah. it doesn't go anywhere good. For sure. Yeah. Uh, but that then that also makes me think now, this was like one of the first mm-hmm. buildings that I bought. So I was really new. But now when I look back and think about how much work and how much time and energy I had to put into this, mm-hmm. I wish I could have just gone into an apartment building. Yeah. A, a way bigger scale and uh, it would make more sense. But again, as an investor, you have to learn along the way. And I learned a lot from this building. I, I learned mm-hmm. tons about construction, about costs, about plumbing, electrical, everything. So it's it's a really cool experience. I, I think just investing in general, you learn so much as it, as time passes, if you keep doing it, right? Yeah, and I think that that's one of the really key things for a good investor is the the openness to learn and the willingness to look backwards and analyze your deals and say, you know, what could have or should have I have done differently? Because mm-hmm. sometimes um, we just get so fixated on finding the next deal, on the adrenaline rush of finding a property for a discount, on you know putting that deal together. Have we learned the lessons that we need to learn from the last one, so we're not repeating our mistakes? Mm-hmm. Yeah. For sure. And and I think another way to kind of learn quickly is to partner with people. Mm-hmm. Uh, just partner with people that are maybe at your level or above your level in terms of um, experience. Yep. And then you can bounce ideas off each other. You can just pick their brains and take advantage in, in the sense that you would like maybe use some of their contractors. They'll use some of yours so that mm-hmm. I've done that recently on a project. And it's been really cool because we've come up with ideas that I wouldn't would have never come up with on my own. Yeah. Yeah, so. absolutely. And and I think, you know, there's different ways that you can acquire the information that you need in order to be a successful investor. And I think partnering is definitely a great way to do yeah. it. Coaching is for sure. Um, I know this is... I'm a little biased about that, but yes. <laughs> I can I can say that um, for new investors or for anyone really, coaching is, is a huge thing. Um, so tell us, like, what are you doing these days with coaching? I, I know you have your own coaching company, which I think you started, what, three years ago? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what are you doing these days? Like, what are you hearing from your from your coaching clients? What are some of the challenges they're facing and how are you coaching them through that? Hmm. Um, well, most of the people, so in the past, I just did one-on-one work um, with stru- with uh, coaching packages so that I d- could develop a relationship and an understanding of where people are and how best to help them move forward. What I'm seeing a lot of lately is there are investors, you know, sort of small to medium-sized investors who their portfolios are struggling and they are negatively cash flowing and they don't know where to begin. Um, and sometimes it's because of that emotional attachment. So I basically, I do strategy calls. I, I do probably four or five a week right now. And I sit down with investors and we look at their portfolio together. We look for opportunities, ways that we can turn things around. And if, you know, we can't figure out how to generate more income, if we can't figure out, you know, how to change the usage, 
um, and move them from a negative cash flow to a positive position, then we talk about, okay, how much of a return is your money generating for you if it's locked into these properties? Is it time to consider selling one or two and then redeploying those funds into something like private lending or into, you know, um, repositioning your, your portfolio, adding extra units that'll generate more income, you know, whatever the solution is for each person. Um, sometimes that second set of eyes or those fresh eyes on a portfolio that, mm-hmm. that's challenged is, is something that is helping people. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the ways that you've been trying to help people increase their cash flow or, or can you share some strategies on, uh, on some of the ways you've been successful in helping people increase their cash flow? Sure. One of my favorite ways to go about it is to look at adding units. Um, you know, if you were to think, for example, let's say you own a a duplex in, I don't know, St. Catharines is your market, right? So how much would a duplex cost? Uh, I guess it depends on the type of property, like if it's a bungalow or whatever. But I'd say right now a duplex is probably between maybe like 400 to five somewhere in that ballpark. Gotcha. So with all the changes they've made with Bill 23, with, um, with all the municipalities kind of, well, I shouldn't say all of them because some of them still won't, but um, a lot of municipalities recognizing that there is a housing issue and, you know, wanting to be part of the solution, it would cost less to add a third unit to that duplex property to add a coach house out back than it would to go and buy a single unit. Yeah. So from an economics perspective, it makes a lot of sense. Right. Right. Yeah, that's true. You that don't have any of the acquisition costs and you're literally taking your portfolio and giving it a tune up for less money than to buy a mm-hmm. new unit. So that's one of my favorites. Another one would be to look at different strategies. Uh, so depending on what market you're in, whether the municipality allows medium or, or short term rentals, that's obviously a great way to be able to turn things around. Um, and sometimes it's, you know, looking at who is your tenant and if you can spend, you know, ten, fifteen thousand dollars on some renovations and some upgrades and attract a tenant who is willing to pay more money um, or whether like that's why I love midterm rentals because you can have these people who are coming in, they're paying a premium to be able to come and go um, and the, to have all the furnishings there. Mm -hmm. So that can be really helpful or beneficial at that point as well. That could be good if you have, let's say, a legal duplex with like an illegal third suite Mm -hmm. in the basement or something. Yeah. You could, I I would assume, depending on the municipality and whatnot, but you might be able to just do medium term rentals on that that third suite. Absolutely. And the other one I love is, you know, if if someone's saying, well, I'm negatively cash flowing right now, but, you know, I don't really want to list it for sale. Okay, well, let's let's do a rent to own on it. You know, if we can find someone who's going to come in that, you know, they're saving towards their down payment, the idea is in three years, they're going to buy the property, then, you know, it's going to boost your cash flow and it could be enough to take you from negative into positive territory so that you can ride out the next three years and then ideally have them buy the property from you. Right, right. Which is something you did with your portfolio, right? With your condos uh, a couple years ago. You have a good memory. (laughs) No, I just did. I I was reading on your website (laughs) before you tell people that. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Just pretend you have a great memory. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's tons of things you could do. Like I know at, um, one of our places we have uh, a big garage, Mm -hmm. which I was using to just store extra renovation materials and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But we had this little space in the, in the house, which was just open. So I thought if I throw a door on that space and use that as a little locker room, then Mm -hmm. I can rent out the garage and get maybe four or 500 bucks a month. So that's helpful with cash flow. for you. Yeah. Just, just a little, whatever, like whatever you could do to try to increase, um, cash flow. We have another, I've talked about this on the podcast, but we have these townhomes side by side that are, we got a nice VTB on them for one year and now they're up for renewal. So with the new rates, they're going to be negative and you have mm. four of them. So that's Oof. not good. Yeah. But we, uh, I had somebody walk through yesterday to look at converting them all into duplexes Perfect. and, um, it's going to be like relatively easy to do that. Mm-hmm. And we're also going to set them up in a way where if the municip- municipality allows for three units in the future, we'll be able to easily do that as well. So good for you. Um, just whatever, whatever you could do to make things work right now. And, um, 
get that cash flow, uh, to increase that cash flow. Yeah, I mean, you can drop, you know, a tool shed on a property for a thousand dollars and and rent it out for you know fifty, seventy five, a hundred dollars a month. You know, if you have a, a property that's got extra parking, maybe there's somebody who would pay you know fifty or a hundred dollars in the winter months for extra parking. I mean, there's lots of different ways that when we start being creative and we get out of that kind of negative, the the you know running the negative scenarios and the what if, what if I can't figure this out, and we go okay. I'm going to figure this out. What do I need to do mm-hmm. to turn this around? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, um, lots of ways to do it for sure. And um, that's, I keep talking about this. Like, I feel like I say this every episode, but it takes creativity to succeed mm-hmm. and uh, the guts to do it. Right? Absolutely, especially yeah. in a market like this. And and. It's funny because I went through 2008 and I knew that there were challenges and I knew that it was a tough time, but I didn't have the knowledge then that I have now. So I have so much more insight into like what's going on and and the market and the implications and everything. Um, And I just feel like there's so much opportunity coming and we need to just focus on how do I get ready for the opportunity. Mm That being said, I've had a lot of people that I've talked to recently and they're trying to time the market. They don't want to buy right now because they think it's going to be cheaper in the future. And I really want to encourage people to remember opportunity cost. So you might be able to buy the same property in six months or 12 months for 20 or 30 or $40,000 less. But when the market comes back up, is that going to make that big a difference for you? You know, I, I to be specific, I had a client who was looking at buying a short-term rental, a vacation property, and he was saying, well, if I close on it, you know, in the fall, it might make more sense. It might, I, cause I might be able to get a better discount. I said, but you will have missed the opportunity to make all that money and to establish that as the place to be, mm-hmm. you know, in that community. And I said, then what does that opportunity cost you? Because you're trying to time the market. And yeah. this is one of the most challenging things that a lot of people are doing is timing the market. Sure. And and to your point about not waiting, uh, a really important thing is to go into pretty much every investment thinking, how do I add value? Yeah. <laughs> not Before it was, you could get away with just buying something based on appreciation alone and, mm-hmm. and getting lucky. Mm-hmm. But now you can't really do that anymore because you don't know if things are going to appreciate or if the prices are going to come down. But if you're able to add value, add cash flow, add a unit, do something, yeah. then it doesn't really matter so much what happens with the market. As long as it doesn't tank completely, yeah. then you're going to be okay. Yeah. And and that's the thing. For most of us, you know, we've got rents coming in that the actual value, unless you're trying to refinance or, or sell, the value of the property doesn't matter so much right now. It's really just, okay, I need to hunker down and figure out how I hold on to this. Mm-hmm. But when I was, when we started in 2008, when we ran numbers, we ran them with a 7% interest rate. And you know, at the time, you know, especially, you know, a lot of people, they, when they run numbers to buy, they're running numbers at, you know, 2% or 3%. You have to make sure before you buy a property that you can withstand some bumps. You know, what is your vacancy rate? What is the interest rate that you can withstand? You know, what kind of fluctuations in the market can you withstand and know that you have alternatives or that you have options? Yeah. But to be fair, um, let's say you were looking a year and a half ago mm-hmm. uh, to buy something and the rates were at 2%. You'd run your numbers and it would hardly work at 2% because things were just so pricey, yeah. so expensive. Yeah. So if you ran the numbers at 7%, there's no way you'd be able to buy anything. It, no. There's no way. And there was so little available. Everybody was just scooping up everything that was there. So yeah. it's kind of... I understand for the people that weren't able to run those numbers that high. It just, it didn't make sense. No, it it didn't. And you would have talked yourself out of a lot of deals. Um, But I think it's important to know what our risk threshold is. And I'll be honest, this is part of the reason why I'm particularly interested in the U.S. right now, because the price per unit is so much lower. Like in Canada, that the cost per unit is so high. You know, when I started, you know, we could buy properties. I mean, I was buying stuff in Kirkland Lake for $20,000 a unit. It wasn't in great condition. It needed a lot of work, but it was $20,000 a unit. Now you're hard pressed to find anything below $125,000. Really? Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. How big, what's the population of Kirkland Lake? 10,000. Wow. A lot of people, again, this is the risk tolerance, right? So a lot of people are saying, I would say that Kirkland Lake is too small a market. They're not comfortable. Mm -hmm. But 
my husband was comfortable. So were our business partners. So away we went. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. Yeah, you don't necessarily need a huge market. Um, yeah. I guess there are other metri- metrics that matter as well. Um, but yeah, do you feel like there's anything we haven't covered? Anything that you want to touch on? Um, I'd love to hear your predictions. I'd love to hear what you think is going to happen in the next 12 to 24 months. Because I always love talking to realtors. Because realtors, mm-hmm. you guys, like you're in the numbers on a day-to-day basis. You see what's going on. Yeah. So what what are you seeing in the market right now? And what do you think is, is going to happen? I So I haven't really been like selling um, residential mm-hmm. properties in the last little while. My wife is doing that. But I am looking at multi-units mm. and... Um, my focus has been on 10 plus unit buildings. Good for you. And what I can see is that um, a lot of the opportunities that are that I'm coming across are overpriced and the sellers are not willing to come down. Mm-hmm. I think there's been a few examples where they bought kind of at the height of the market and they don't want to sell for a loss. So they're just holding on or they're just not going to sell. Yeah. Uh, so there's been a lot of that going on. In terms of my prediction of what's going to happen, I, I don't know. I, I think... I think the rates will come down. Mm-hmm. I hope they do. Yeah. <laughs> I think the uh, the people that are setting up all of these policies are going to realize that you know they've made a huge impact, mm-hmm. and eventually it's going to settle. So um, all I know is I'm still looking for opportunities, and they're not easy to come by. And it's not like you know it's all roses here. We've got some issues to deal with in our own portfolio, but mm-hmm. I don't want to stop. I I truly believe that this is a kind of a once in a lifetime opportunity for people my age that are um, looking to grow their portfolio because I don't know how many more opportunities like this will come around. Maybe there will be one or two other ones in my life, but uh, yeah. this is a really great opportunity. Yeah, it, it is for sure. And, you know, if you don't have access to capital, then this is the time to, you know, start thinking about, you know, what skills do I have? What knowledge do I have? Who can I partner with so that we can both achieve our goals together? Yeah, yeah. For sure. Um, so I think for anyone listening, take advantage of this market because it's a really cool, cool time, cool opportunity. Good. Scary, but but lots of uh, options for us. For sure. I, I Just one last thing on that. I remember... Uh, when I, like before I kind of got started investing, I would sort of hope for a, a recession because I thought it would be, uh, interesting to, to take advantage of it. Cause I know a lot of people in the past, a lot of successful people grew during a recession. So yes. that's what I wanted. But now that we're actually here, I don't know how, how I feel about it. But anyway, um, yeah, so that's, uh, I think we covered some good stuff. Do you want to just maybe share like how people reach you and, they already know you're a coach. So is there anything specifically, do you have anything coming up, any events, anything of that sort? I'm so glad you asked. So I uh, I hosted a, a summit, co-hosted a summit with uh, a gentleman named Corey Spurley from BC uh, in the fall of 2022. And it, it was amazing. I'd never done an online summit before. I wasn't really too sure how it would work out. And it was fantastic. We had a great time. There was so much great information. We got fantastic feedback from everyone who attended. So I'm really excited to say that we're going to do it again. Cool. It's going to be October 14th and, and 15th of 23. And our topic, as always, is resilience. How can we be more resilient as real estate investors? How can we bounce back faster? How can we pivot from challenges more quickly? Um, how can we set ourselves up for success so that, you know, when things are roses and sunshine again, that we're benefiting um, as, as much as possible from yeah, that. For sure. Cool. Um, contact. Oh, yeah. You can find me on Facebook or on Instagram, Elizabeth Kelly Consulting. And uh, yeah, if you'd like to book a strategy call with me, I would absolutely love the opportunity to dive into your portfolio and see what we can do to turn it around. Awesome. Thank you again for coming by. It's nice to meet you face to face. And I wish you all the best. Fantastic. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode. Your support is truly appreciated. And if you can share this with a friend or family member that might benefit from the information, remember our goal is to motivate and inspire others to take action and to build wealth and to become well off. Enjoy the rest of your day.